Hello, everyone. Welcome to this broadcast. Every Friday, we will try our best to talk to up and comers. And this will be kind of a supplement to my town hall column. You may have seen me do that for other prominent guests and up and comers. And today we are joined by Mr. Jalen Johnson, someone I've known for a little bit, who is an up and comer. He is leaving DC. He's left DC after spending some time in Congress to run for city commissioner in Albany, Georgia for the ward two spot. So Jalen is going to talk about his race. He recently went on Fox news, his first appearance ever on the channel to talk about the launch. And he's been making some appearances and we greatly appreciate him talking with us here on my channel and also for townhall.com for my column. So Jalen, thanks so much for coming on. Good to talk to you. Congrats on running for office. And share with my watchers and viewers, what propelled you to run for the Ward 2 position? First of all, thank you so much for having me on, Gabriella. It's amazing and it's an honor to uh, talk to you on this side of the end, you know, because we usually are outdoors fishing and, yes. and doing fun activities. So I'm excited to be here. And simply what propelled me to go back to my local community and pursue local office, two simple things, my family and the fact that local government is everything. You know, if I'm going to say that I'm a conservative minded young man who believes in small government, I need to go back home and, and get into the weeds of things where things actually happen. Uh, I've worked in Congress in Washington, D.C. I've worked on the federal level for a little bit, and I've seen how nothing gets done. It's constant gridlock, constant bickering and bashing back and forth. Nothing really gets done here. You know, the issues that we complain about up here in Washington, things like defunding the police and critical race theory. Think about this, guys. That didn't happen overnight. It's been brewing in the local communities and at the local level for decades. We have reacted and not been proactive. And that's what I'm all about. I realized that the only way you can get that done is by being in your community, talking with constituents at their door face to face. Saving my family and saving my community is what I'm about. And that is essentially why I've decided to go back to Albany, Georgia to run for city commission. Talk about your life story. I remember during one car ride, we had to my friend's property out in West Virginia. We did some shooting earlier this year and you told me your life story. And I was really just astounded by what you've gone through and just the perseverance you've had and how successful you've become despite some of the circumstances you were born into. So talk about your life story. I think that's really important and impactful. And I think that'll help contextualize why you decided to run for city commissioner. No, for sure, Gab. Uh, I was born in Albany, Georgia, on the east side uh, to a single mother. Uh, uh, my mom has five kids. My father has never been in my life. He's never done anything for me. Uh, my mother, pretty much, you know, growing up, didn't really have, we didn't have any money. I mean, we were in and out of the projects, Section 8 housing, didn't have a firm foundation to live on. Uh, and, and we had to find a way to hustle and, and grind out. I remember when I was in elementary school, uh, you know, we didn't have a dryer for a little bit and we had to dry our clothes on the uh, ceiling fan and would go to school and kids would pick on you because you would be wearing hand-me-down clothes and they would notice that you smelled a little off and th things like that. I mean, growing up with the constant, you know, bullying and things of like that and all because of your upbringing, something that you could not control, right? Um, we were extremely poor, but uh, my great, my grandma was a police officer and she was kind of the backbone of our, our uh, household because my mom was the only child. So my grandma took care of us whenever she could and however she could. But keep in mind, she still had her own priorities and her own, not priorities, but her own bills and things that she had to take care of. So it was a struggle. I mean, you know, we didn't have anything. We didn't have money. We didn't have luxuries. We didn't have, you know, oftentimes know where we were going to stay. I mean, I remember growing up with the lights being off sometimes and it was the struggle. It was the real life struggle. And um, I saw some of those you know, things that have that adversity that happened in my life, I kind of saw how my older brothers kind of fell by the wayside a little bit by getting into some not some not so good things early on. And that was pretty much my example of why I want it to be a little bit different. I just told myself, well, hey, if I don't smoke that weed, or if I don't join that gang, or if I don't, you know, be bad in school, maybe I can be a little bit better than what my life circumstances are at this time. And that's what kind of got me involved. I realized that legislation and how your upbringing is everything, right? Because we know uh, the history of, uh, of the Democratic Party. We know the history and the, the, um, the stronghold they've had over the Black community for decades, which have propelled many of our families into a constant cycle of poverty. And I told myself that I'm going to break that cycle for my family because I'm going to go to college. I'm going to be the first in my family to go to college, and I'm going to do something with my life. So that's kind of how, how it was growing up for me. And in your ad that was produced by our mutual friend, Madison Hughes, 
You talked about working in a movie theater. I know you've done, what was it, college to Congress. Could you speak to those experiences oh, yeah. and how those also shaped your worldview and then kind of got you involved in politics as well? Yeah. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, I, I became the drum major of the band. So I was the ultimate leader uh, underneath the band director, and I was able to oversee a group of other students. Uh, and that's kind of where my leadership skills kind of developed. And while I was doing that, though, there were fees that needed to be paid. And I had to work at a movie theater every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with one of my best friends. Uh, I was there for about three years while I was in high school. So I didn't really get to enjoy many of the Friday night lights and things of that nature because I had to work, you know, for seven twenty-five an hour just to be able to pay for uniforms, to be able to pay for phone bills and things of that nature. Uh, and, and, and it was a struggle. It was a constant struggle for me. And uh, when I when I applied to college, I didn't know I was going to get accepted, but I did. Uh, by the grace of God, I like to say, and uh, I, I was the first in my family to go to college, didn't know what I was doing, but opportunities started to present themselves around my junior year, uh, right in the middle of me, you know, being a criminology major, because I wanted to follow in my grandma's footsteps and be a police officer, but I got involved in politics, kind of on that local grassroots level, and that's where I found college to Congress. I was browsing the internet, and I saw an ad for an all expenses paid for internship that could send you to Washington, D.C. to intern for a member of Congress, and I was like, this can't be true. So I click on it and I apply. And by the grace of God, again, I got accepted. And in 2019, I went to Washington, D.C. for the first time ever. And I interned for Senator David Perdue. And it was the best opportunity I had of a lifetime. College to Congress plugged me in. They paid for all of our housing, all of our clothing. They even gave us Uber stipends. They paid for our meals, everything. It was all expenses paid for, just like they said. And that was my start in Washington. And from there, the rest is history. And it's just, it, it became a, a boom for me. Yes. And you did a few other internships. Then you eventually worked for the Trump reelection campaign. Then you most recently served as a legislative aide for Congressman Byron Donald of Florida. So you have done all, and you're only 22, which I think people yeah. should know. You're really young. You've accomplished so much in just a short amount of time. That's super impressive. Just even from the outset, I think everyone can can very much agree with that. And you're just so motivated and, and certainly age shouldn't be, you know, a discriminating factor to preclude you from office. But for a 22 year old, you've done a lot. You've overcome adversity. You've been very successful and just goes to show that you can do anything you put your mind to and that the conservative ethos does work. And in those um, experiences, you got to see conservatism at play. Did it mold you more into a conservative? And, and did you always identify as conservative? What kind of was your thinking about the philosophy? Why did you incline yourself to these policies? Yeah, no. So my family structure, like my great grandma, grandma, and my mom, you know, everybody in my family pretty much followed into that same uh, a, a group, you know, think of, of being a Democrat because, you know, my mom was a Democrat, so I'm a Democrat. Well, I like to tell people, I actually never was a Democrat uh, and, and I never voted Democrat and I never was a Democrat, um, but, you know, but it's funny because my family all are. And, and, and But, you know, the thing is we can all sit down and we can have those conversations, but the, what what took me off of the path of, of, of that line of thinking was the idea of the nuclear family, the idea of freedom, the idea of you can be whatever you want to be because it's up to you. And I think the modern day Democratic Party, you can take a lot of that from them because it's all about cancel, cancel, cancel culture. You can you can no longer forgive people for what they've done. You can no longer be responsible and accountable for your own life. It's all about blaming the big bad man. And that's just not what I'm about as a black man in America. I need to take some responsibility for my actions. If I sag my pants, that's on me. If I go and smoke a little dope, that's on me. That's not the government's fault. And the problem is the Democratic Party has found a way to take all of that blame and responsibility and give it to the government. The ultimate plan is if you take all that responsibility and accountability from the individual, they no longer are, are can have those actions on their own. Now they have the government to blame and that's what they want to do. They don't want us to be able to be responsible for our own actions. It's all a part of their ultimate plan. And I'm never gonna fall into that category. I'm never gonna fall into that, that mindset of thinking. I want to be the captain of my faith and the master of my soul, period. So yes, DC has made me more conservative from seeing that, from seeing that through the lens of, you know, just recently, Gabriella, I was, it was right when the mass mandate policy became loosened in DC, you know, the mayor, Mayor Bowser, I mean, who is no one's, you know, everybody knows where she stands. 
in Washington, D.C., she even said, you know, months ago, not now, but months ago, that we could loosen the mass restrictions. Even the United States Capitol had loosened the restrictions on masks. And I got accosted by someone, you know, in, inside the United States Capitol for not wearing a mask. I'm like, well, I thought the policy was that, you know, it's, you know, if you're vaccinated or whatever, you don't have to wear a mask. But people have now felt emboldened to attack other people and not mind their business. That goes back to that accountability standpoint. Where I come from in the hood, if you're not minding your own business, you get into a lot of trouble that you probably wouldn't have got into if you just kept your mouth closed. So a lot of people have found a way to cancel other people and feel like they're empowered to go up to others and yell at them and, and attack them for not doing something that they don't want to do. Where has that freedom gone? This is the United States of America. So. And obviously, Albany, Georgia is not Washington, D.C., it's a place you grew up in. It's very different. I think from most cities, I think I told you it's very different from where I grew up and that's okay. You know, every place is different. Every place has positives, negatives. You can find bad things in Orange County, California. You can find bad things in Miami, Florida. You can find bad things in Washington, DC, good things too. In every place, same in Albany, Georgia. So because of your love and dedication to your hometown, you decided that this position would be the best way to test the political waters what exactly are you campaigning on? Could you talk about some of your campaign points and your, the issues that you're going to be fighting for? Because everything is local. You had mentioned that all politics is local and great change can come locally. And I think for a long time, Republicans had abandoned the cities and they've also abandoned localities and ceded those to those on the left or kind of those who are not conservative. And we see now with different issues that people want to retake the school boards. They want to retake local positions because that's where control that is most immediately felt happens. So talk about your platform and what issues you plan to prioritize if you are to be elected to city commission. For sure. On day one, uh, when, when I'm elected to the city commission, I plan to fully uh, staff and fund the Albany Police Department. Gap, just yesterday, uh, three people were shot right around the corner from where I live in my, in my hometown of Albany, Georgia. Three, three people. Uh, when I went off to college, I remember talking to a police sergeant in, in that town and uh, he I was talking to him just about some of his experiences. And I was like, hey, sir, you know, how many homicides have you investigated, you know, as a, as a, as a sergeant in this city? He told me he hadn't saw not one. And he was there for 16 years. He had not saw one homicide in his entire career. My city this year alone, Gabriella, Albany, Georgia, this year alone is already up to about 20 homicides Jeez. this year. We average about three a month. There was just a shooting yesterday. Three people were shot near my house. So this is ridiculous. This idea that a majority black city with a majority pol black police department can defund the police is atrocious. We literally, an uh, independent commission came into the city of Albany and did a study that showed that we only had about 52 patrol officers on the street. We're supposed to have about 150 or so. That is insane. So that's gonna be my number one priority, public safety. No businesses are gonna to want to come into the city of Albany to offer any ounce of economic develop, de development if the product can't even get in the front door. If they fear getting hit upside the head, they're not gonna come there. Here, that is why people have seen businesses leave Albany, Georgia, is because they don't feel safe. And that is my priority. I wanna prioritize public safety, my family safety, and the community safety. And number two, back to small businesses, economic development. We can't do that without having a safe city. So that's why the first priority is going to be first. But some economic policies, what would you do in your capacity as a city commissioner to draw businesses? Would you offer certain incentives? Would you create some sort of opportunity zones for people to come back and start businesses? Because what we're seeing now with different policies in place, unfortunately, they may mandate that you have to. I don't think this is going to happen in Georgia, but some businesses, bigger conglomerates will mandate that you need to have proof of this or mask mandates. Um, a lot of small businesses are really struggling to bounce back. And I don't know if this is going to hamper small business creation going forward, but what do you see as being a possible successful policy to implement in Albany, Georgia, despite some of the conditions that are already there? Yeah, I think what we need to do is we need to, uh, you know, take the lead. I mean, we saw how successful Senator Tim Scott was on the federal level with opportunities on these are programs that the federal government has appropriated for local governments to, to uh, tap into. And I think a problem that we have in the city of Albany is that we have a lot of seasoned leadership, as I like to say, of people who don't really have any legislative experience 
they're more they're more so activists right they're preaching to their little group of people but they're not doing what's best for the entire city my wealth of knowledge from writing policy in dc uh, i'm going to be able to tap into some to some of those federal government programs uh, that are positive pro-business that can bring in you know businesses and we're going to lower taxes on the local level uh, albany has had a surplus of of uh, funding uh, over the past few years. Of course, we had a bad year last year because of COVID, but I think going forward, we can kind of see more of a surplus of funding where we can try to allocate some of those funds mm -hmm. to some business startups, give people uh, the, a process to where they can apply for some local uh, state grants uh, to start a business. So those are some things that I'm gonna be able to sit down with the mayor and other commissioners and help write those and help uh, draft up the proper you know language for those bills and things of that nature so it, it, it's going to be a, it's going to be a slow process because COVID has kind of impacted a lot of that but we're, we're definitely going to get people back to work i want to encourage everyone in the city of albany that look getting that unemployment once a week that 700 dollars is not going to be worth it when you can go find a job somewhere else where you can potentially make a little bit more than that i would rather have sustainability and that's what we need to try to give people uh an opportunity to be sustainable and not just benefit from something that is so temporary. If you have the capacity to do this as a city commissioner, what industries would you like to see in the Albany, Georgia area? Definitely probably textile industry, um, maybe energy producers. I have to become a little more familiar with South Georgia, but what industries do you think would be welcomed in the area and uh, be sought after by the citizens and residents of Albany, Georgia? What, what industries do you think would play well there? If uh, economic incentives were created, if the business climate were to be maximized and fully realized, what do you, what do you foresee uh, as possibly coming? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, energy, definitely it's there. Uh, I mean, the farming industry is huge and Southwest Georgia, uh, we we can offer some incentives to get you know more Tyson plants or things of that nature nature down there, or we could do things like entertainment. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that that the city of Albany could benefit from because if we go back to my number one priority of talking about crime, well, it's probably because a lot of people are either bored and don't have anything to do. Uh, that also uh, plays a factor into it. I mean, when you're riding downtown and you see things like the State Theater are closed and you see that we only have one uh, you know store or things of that nature. So people probably could use more entertainment. Um, and, and, and as far as business wise, uh, I know we have a place called uh, Pretoria Fields, which is a brewery. That was a big, big uh, boom for, for South Georgia and for my hometown because we hadn't seen one in that, in that area ever. So I think just more entertainment, more fun things to do uh, would benefit my city in particular. And then do you think maybe down there, this may be something relating to your interest with bass fishing, but are there enough bodies of water or good lakes nearby that could attract like a Bassmaster Classic or something of that nature, like outdoor activities, you think that could spur economic growth? For sure. I mean, we, we have the Flint River uh, and it flows through my hometown. Um, as far as lakes, I can't really think of anything right now in, in my vicinity, uh, but no, for sure. We, we had, so we actually had a place called Gander Mountain, which was similar to like a Bass Pro Shops or something. It was, the, it was one of the biggest stores in Albany Gap and it closed, it closed less than a year. I don't know if the business just wasn't there or if the industry didn't want to be there, but we need something like that back down there. I mean, the hunting, the, 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 the fishing down in South Georgia, I mean, you can go anywhere, you know, outside of Albany, and you can get some good, you know, fishing, some good hunting spots. Albany can be a hub for where people can come and purchase their, you know, rods and reels and their, their tools and materials. And it's like, it was so sad to see that, that uh, business leave. And, and I think we should bring it, I should try to help bring it back. Yeah, because of your personal attachment to fishing, you can obviously personalize and be like, I know what this does. It'll help get people focused. And I think fishing is also a gateway to freedom too, for many things. Like if you're low income or you're stressed or something, it's a gateway to be away from distractions, put your mind at ease. And maybe that could be something you focus on, but there are different programs all across the country that are trying to specialize that. So maybe with your fishing chops, you can do that as well. Cause outdoor recreation is a huge economic driver. It's a billion dollar plus industry. So that could be something that you could explore as well. And then are there any other issues? Do you hope to provide maybe let's say like government transparency about cost spending things of that sort, because I know people are very concerned about how their tax dollars are spent. What other issues do you hope to focus on as well? For sure. Uh, Albany, Georgia has a huge infrastructure problem. We have a 1950 sewer uh, infrastructure project that hasn't been completed. And the EPA actually slapped a violation on the city to say that we had uh, until I think 2024 to uh, allocate money towards that to fix it, or the, the federal government was gonna fine the city of Albany like a million dollars a year. 
this is some, this could be a Flint, Michigan situation, right? Like if the pipe, the pipes, uh, the the sewer things are not being fixed, people's you know homes can be affected, their quality of life and quality of water can be affected. So our city commission had a really big struggle uh, a few months back where the Biden administration allocated some money to the city and a lot of community folk were coming out saying that, hey, I want, uh, instead of using this $10 million for infrastructure, uh, we need to break this money up. And can I get a million dollars for my food insecurity program? Can I get them like all these people were coming out of the woodworks asking the city commission for money. But a lot of people started raising the eyebrows because they were, they were asking the questions, where's the accountability? So if, if we do give you this money, where's your board? Who's going to oversee where that money goes? Who's Do, do you have an, a spending outcome? You know, can you provide any of us the data for what you're going to do with this money? No one could provide those answers. It was just people asking for money from the city. And ultimately, the city decided to put that money towards the infrastructure uh, project. And I think that, that uh, a lot of people feel like that would benefit the city as a whole. But that's something that I would be able to get in there and listen to the citizens, but while also listening to the, the needs of, uh, of, of, the, of the knowledge of the city commission. Because oftentimes, you have a, one group of citizens who are advocating for everybody, and then you have a few who are advocating for themselves. So I think I can be that, that, that bridge uh, between the two voices and provide my perspective on that. So infrastructure is also going to be something that I'm going to get in there and, and hit hard on too. That's great. And I don't think this should be an issue for you, but I, I've noticed in some other races and, and local races, I think some people try to put like a national spin to it. And even though you're openly conservative, I don't think you'll have an issue doing this, but do you have concerns that people may be turned off by your conservative credentials or because you are campaigning on local issues, they're not really going to care or maybe they'll resonate and be like, we want something new and different? Because I know sometimes um, placating certain attitudes for local races uh, sometimes can have a detrimental effect. But I don't, I don't see that happening with you. But but do you think people can see past what you've done nationally and be like, I trust Jalen because he's a native son of Albany, Georgia? And maybe we need a refreshing kind of reformer voice like him, because what we've had is not working. It's a status quo. And maybe we need to have a free market type of limited government approach to city council or city commission. Yeah. So I'm not running in Albany, Georgia, as a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, obviously, my record speaks for itself and people know who I am and what I'm about. I'm about family. I'm about faith and I'm about freedom. Uh, people know that. And uh, will that turn some voters off? Absolutely. Uh, but will that draw in a lot of voters? Absolutely. Uh, so what we're going to do, we're going to govern for the people. It's going to be a campaign uh, for the people, for sure, because I was born and raised on the east side. I understand how it feels to face adversity. I understand how it feels to be dirt freaking poor. And I made it. And I was able to get out, go to college, learn a lot, and come back and fight for my community, fight for my family, fight for everyone that's there. So if they don't trust that record alone, and if they want to go with the same status quo that has failed time and time again, then that's just where it stands. But I'm going to be me always, first and foremost. So definitely, you know, it's a nonpartisan race, and I hope that voters can see that. I hope that they can see past the party politics and be able to vote for someone like myself who's simply has a record that speaks for itself. Uh, I'm very familiar with the issues. I'm very familiar with the community because it is my community. So I just hope that the voters can see that for sure. Yeah, I don't think you being a conservative should have an issue if you're campaigning on the right issues and you're trying to get some broad cross appeal, which is possible. I think people forget that conservatives can have broad appeal and appeal to even those in the middle and the center and the, the uh, left a little bit, center left a little bit too. So yeah, I don't know why we can't say that. Yeah, our ideas can appeal to people in the middle as well um, because we support low, low taxes, you know, limited government that appeals to everyone regardless of exactly. political ideas. So yeah, I don't think there is an issue really with because you're conservative, you won't be able to appeal to people locally. No, I think it's just how you campaign, the style that you implement and that you incorporate into your campaign. So no, I, I think I'm confident you can do well in that respect. And maybe let's move a little towards nationally. So we have heard a lot about the black vote. Certainly Republicans have made a lot of gains and it's wonderful. What do you think the Republican Party should do to continue to build up on the successes and goals that were reached uh, in the last few years? And what issues do you think will play well with black voters? Because we, we've talked about this kind of privately, but we see kind of a crossroads where some in the Republican Party, not so much the Republican Party, but some in the conservative movement want to move away from free markets. And they think that supporting corporations means you're for free markets. It's not corporate. The corporate conglomerates are just as kind of problematic as big government at times. And then we see people who just want to kind of move into this populist attitude, which to me does not resonate with minority voters because they're small business owners. They want government off their backs. 
So what do you see as a way for appealing to black voters and let's say perhaps non-traditional voters that are starting to incline to the Republican Party? Do we continue what we've done? Talk about the little guy, little gal, small business, or do we explore kind of this philosophy, which I don't know if is going to be palatable uh, for the movement going forward. But but what is your thinking on that? No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, uh, you know, fighting for the corporations is not going to speak to, you know, minority business owners, <clears throat> and especially in cities like mine. But believe it or not, Gabriella, I hear this so much, right? And I, I know this is something that you hear a lot too, but a lot of people are fiscally conservative and socially liberal. A lot of minorities and a lot of Black Americans just can't get on the bandwagon and the, the rhetoric with the Republican Party per se, just because of some of the social issues. If that wasn't a factor, I think this, I think most people would be conservative because I think in my community, we're so family oriented, Gabriella. Like, my great grandmother, who's almost 80, she's all about helping within the family. Like, I mean, talking about if you ever need anything, you know, money or, you know, supplies or anywhere to stay, they are all about, we are all about family. And that is something that is so traditional and so at its core. But many people on the far left are trying to break that up. They're trying to take that apart. So do I think we continue doing exactly what we've, we've been doing? No, because it obviously it didn't work. We know we, we see that it didn't work. But do I think that the previous administration did a better job? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, more black men, you know, in, in history voted for the previous president than, than any other uh, Republican president. So obviously it's been working. And I think that we can just build upon that. We need to show people that look at the gas prices, look at inflation, go try to buy a home, look at energy costs, look at other countries, how they're laughing at us, look at stock the stock market. These are things that those small blue collar God's country Bible belt Americans, when you expose that to them, they're going to wake up and smell the coffee and say, things aren't what they seem. And I think that's how you penetrate the minds of, of Black Americans for sure, by, by, by uh, exposing this BS rhetoric that's coming from the current administration and show the results. You go try to buy a house right now. You go try to buy a car right now. You go try to put some gas in your car right now. And that's how you expose them because we've never seen it like we've ever would like, I mean, probably since Jimmy Carter, but it's yeah. been a while since it's been this tough. So <laughs> Yeah, I think when things become personal and you're personally afflicted, that's when you kind of have a switch that turns off. I mean, I've always been conservative, so I've never had that issue. But I've I've seen people here in Virginia who are like, I was a lifelong Democrat because of the school closures. I can never vote for a Democrat again statewide or federally. So I was like, whoa, that is cool to see. And I also think sometimes the social issues I think I mean, we're socially conservative. I'm pro-life. I believe in the family unit, too. I just don't know about government really encouraging family creation which is what we're seeing a little bit with some of the populist rhetoric, because to me, that's that doesn't seem really like pro family. If you're encouraging the government to have to tell you to have however many kids, if it, dating is already enough hard to do. So like government is not going to mandate dating, which leads to marriage and then family creation that has to be left to the individuals and churches to encourage people to do that. Should they choose, you know, to want to one day get married, settle down, have kids. But I also think the life issue is something very important to Black Americans. I know they're very pro-life as well. Same with Hispanic voters. Um, they've been turned off by kind of the far left rhetoric on that issue as well about um, also a family issue about education, school choice, and how important it is to be able to be the decider of your kid's future. We've seen that kind of uh, awaken people in the last year with teachers unions controlling uh, curriculum. Uh, now people seeing exactly what they're getting with public education, school choice. I know, I think it's a, a social issue. It's an important issue because you are the decider. You should be the decider of your kid's future. You should be able to go to a better school and not be hindered by your zip code, things of that sort. So do you also see those issues kind of resonating with people? I think school choice is a wedge issue that can bring a lot of people who are not really politically aligned with us into our movement and into the party too. Do you see it that way as well? One thousand percent. One thousand percent. I think actually COVID, you know, has been a uh, has, has been has I go back to my point about exposing things. Right. Many kids have came home, you know, during COVID and worked virtually and online. And I, a lot of parents have seen what their kids have been learning and have seen uh, what their teachers have been teaching the kids. And they've been like, this is not what I sent my kid to school to, 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 to go and learn. And that's why we're seeing all these parents in Virginia and in Georgia uh, go to these school board meetings and blow up about CRT and about the way that their kids are, are being taught and what they're learning. The rhetoric is being exposed and more people are waking up. I would love to see the numbers on how many people support school choice now and how many people uh, are, are against 
the, the, the rhetoric that we've been seeing because I've seen, I can't tell you how many videos I've seen of a parent. I mean, black parents too. Like, like we're not just talking about, you know, white kids, parents. No, black parents have been blowing up at school board meetings about the teachings that they their kids have been learning. Yeah, I, I think it's largely actually coming from minority parents. I've seen this in here in Virginia who, and I mean, yeah. white parents too, everyone all across the board, but you're seeing a lot more minority voices. We have a great school here in Northern Virginia. That's the magnet school. It's the science-based school and predominantly it's kids who are from Asian backgrounds, from minority backgrounds who do very academically well and they've changed the standards. So that's awakened a lot of people, a lot of parents who pay a lot of money to send their kids to good schools and they're lowering uh, admission standards for that to say, well, we need to hit these quotas. And then you see this all across Loudoun County and Fairfax County. Every school district I feel is, is experiencing this, whether you live in a big city, small city, mid-sized town, things of that sort. So yeah, I think it was a good sunlight disinfectant moment. Uh, unfortunately, it had to come through something like the pandemic, but I think it does give rise to making this a local issue. I think school choice, there is actually a lot of polling that came out recently. I'll send you some stuff after our broadcast too, about um, changing attitudes for school choice in its favor. And there's a great guy by the name of Corey DeAngelis. If you don't know him, he's great. But I don't know if you'll be able to handle schooling issues as city commissioner. But since you do support school choice, and I know you're affiliated with different organizations that have worked for school choice issues, um, I think that could be a local issue too, letting people decide that. But yeah, that that really is kind of the emerging issue. That's how Ron DeSantis won in Florida in 2018. It's kind of a, a make or break issue for really tight races. So I think Republicans would be smart to campaign on that issue, make it local, give parents more oversight over their kids' decision, and really kind of stick it to the teachers' unions because they've just they I've known this early on. I maybe I was just unfortunate to have parents who saw political uh, kind of corruption with teachers' unions in California early on, but they really don't care about kids. They just care about pocketing and lining their salaries they they work only nine months out of the year for the most part and they get so much in money they don't care about kids it's all about power and control and and trying to mold and shape kids to think a certain way i absolutely agree it's going to be i hope it doesn't become the death of our uh, um, education system for the next generation i think we all have a have a duty to fight for the next generation to make sure that why can't we just leave kids alone allow them to learn grow play and be kids that, that that's that's all i ask and it seemed like it's so hard it said like at every turn the far far left are indoctrinating our youth into and, and, you know just just let kids play you know let kids leave kids alone it, it's kind of where i stand <laughs> it should be a laissez-faire approach totally agree i think yeah. uh, young kids today i don't have any kids but i have a niece and uh but i see I have friends with kids and they're trying to shape them and mold them in, in a positive way. But you see a lot of kids who are afraid to get their hands dirty. They don't like to go outdoors. They're afraid to touch fish and to handle worms or to rig their own rod or spend time camping. And they're just glued on their cell phones and their game consoles. And that, that can be a problem. And we start to see kids just too hooked on technology and they're not aware of their surroundings. They don't know about nature around them. They don't know about current events and things of that sort. So yeah, no, that, that totally is a consequence of education where you have bureaucrats just deciding what is right, what is not right. And while the parents should be the ones administering this type of thing. I agree. No, for sure. Let's talk about, so you like to fish. I want my listeners to know what led you to discover the sport, obviously because of the Flint river, how did you get hooked onto it? And do you think that could be a good way of getting people to learn about being kind of an individual, to learn about being self-sufficient. What drew you to fishing and why do you like it so much? I think that's something we should discuss too. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I think, oh, so I, I, I can remember uh, right before I went off to of college, I went to Walmart, got me a little rod and reel just because I, I was like, hmm, if I go out here in this wall, I didn't know what I was doing, Gabrielle. I was so <laughs> bad. Go out here at this water and just throw it in. I wonder if I'll catch anything. But I think the calmness and hearing the water, because when you go out to the Flint River in Albany, you literally going kind of into the woods and then you have the river kind of secluded. And it's just so peaceful. It was at it was at a point in time where I didn't have to worry about, you know, hearing about anybody else talking or hearing any traffic. I was kind of alone in my own headspace, just doing something. And then once I kind of learned more about it, I got to college 
my college friends uh, did a lot of fishing. One of my buddies, Jackson, he did a lot of fishing. So he took me uh, to go fish with him and he showed me a lot more. He showed me about uh, uh, bait casters and, and all the different lures and things of that nature. And then I, I started becoming really good at it. And it was just so fun to, to throw a, uh, you know, th throw a hook out there and you get a bass bite on it and you get that nice tug and pull and that feeling, that adrenaline, you know, it's a, it's a sport, it's a game, it's fun. It's, it's quiet, it's peaceful uh, because you're sitting there waiting for something to bite. It's the anticipation aspect that I think that I was waiting for. It was always, can I get the bigger fish next time? And that drew me in, that made me pump. And I've always wanted to go back and go back and go to different places. And um, I think, yeah, the anticipation and the peacefulness of just going out and throwing a hook in, in, a hook in the water is just, it's, it's, it's so good for me, so. You like eating any fish catches? I mean, oh, I do, you do like eating the fish. Okay, good. Cause yeah, we have catch and release anglers and we have put and take anglers. I like both styles. It depends on the situation and whatever conditions so when, they when system. I'm bass fishing, I'm catch and release. Oh, that's you fine. Know. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, you know, if there's any other, you know, catch cleaning cooks, we do, you know, I got, you know, some salmon or, you know, or anything like some trout or anything like that. We're eating, we're eating good. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. No. And I think it's so refreshing that candidates or lawmakers do fishing. So I had to throw in that question for you to talk about and, and share your love. Cause we've gone on two fishing trips. We went to Maryland where we first officially met. And then we did, tried to do a little bit of fly fishing locally. I caught a catfish on the fly. We didn't have much success with trout. I think they came a little later after that date and it was raining. So it was not the best conditions, but we didn't get to do some more fishing adventures, but in the future, I have no doubt we will be able to do that. So Jalen, Defer my viewers to where they can follow your campaign, support you financially or even morally, whatever they can they can allow um, your social media channels and every important link relating to your efforts. And when is the election happening, by the way? Yeah, no, for sure. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Uh, everybody watching and listening, you can go to JalenJJohnson.com. That's spelled J-A-L-E-N, JJohnson.com. Uh, it's my website for my campaign. You'll see all the information about me, uh, where you can also contribute and where you can contact me. If you just want to put in a message of support or if you want to donate $25 or $50, uh, you'll be able to find it there. Uh, but the election is November 2nd of this year, actually. It's going to be a really mm. quick election um, because it's, you know, it's a local municipality. The election is November 2nd, so I need all the help and all the support. Prayers are, are, are needed uh, and also contributions are needed to run a campaign. Uh, so... That, yeah, that's that's pretty much how it's going to look. Like I said, just go to jalenjjohnson.com and, and you follow me there. You'll be able to find my social media handles on the website as well. Perfect. I will include that for the tabs below and also in my column as well. So people will not miss a beat with connecting with you. We'll share across social media on my personal end and we'll defer people to you as well. So Jalen, it has been such a pleasure. I'm glad we're able to catch up virtually. Sad we can't go fishing right now, but we'll we'll get to it maybe after campaign season if you hopefully win. But best of luck on your campaign. I am so proud of you. And thank you again for sitting down with me to talk about your platform and what's on your mind about current events. Gabriella, you're the best. Thank you so much for the opportunity.